I'll do it. So how does it work? You see something happening in the culture, you feel it kind of coming to a head, and you're like, all right, I need to make fun of this. You know, most of the time, yeah, but no. I I kind of, I, I actually, once I stepped away from Scary Movie franchise, I was just like, oh, I'm never gonna do another parody again. And then I found myself sitting there, and it kind of dragged me back in. Because I was just trying to do a found footage comedy. I you was sound like, like Al Pacino. It, it, it did, every time I tried to get it, you dragged me back in. <laughs> And so I was, I was just watching uh, found footage movies because I was wanted to be the first one to do a found footage comedy, and uh, I was just like watching Paranormal Activity. And I was like, boy, white people do some really dumb stuff in these movies. And then I was just like, what if Paranormal Activity happened to a black couple? And then boom, I called Rick Alvarez, my producer partner, and we just went at it for like two hours. He came over, we went at it, and before we knew we had 20 pages of jokes, and we was like, let's go. Well, the reason why the movie works is because it's shot just like a paranormal movie, where yeah. you guys are in the house, and that's it. It seems like Well, pretty... there's a story. Well, yeah. It's not just kind of floating around in the atmosphere with a bunch of sketches. There's an actual story. This is, ostensibly, this is a love story. Yeah, it, it does have a story, whereas I think parody, where, where, when it's done wrong, it has no story. It makes no sense. You're watching and a bunch of dailies or something. Yeah, like you're just going, why am I in Narnia? What the f <laughs> what, Who put something in my weed? That's not, I'll be Well, I have to ask you, what is the secret to keeping, I don't know, keeping it together when you're doing scenes with Marlon? Like, oh, do you have says little I, tricks? Who says I do? Well, you have to like no. be able to um, keep it together for part of it. For part of it, yeah. But there are definitely moments where I blew takes because somebody would do something so <laughs> outrageous Dude. that like, you Cedric know. Cedric and those guys, when uh, we was doing the exorcism scene, tears. When we were, when Nick is in the room <laughs> as the psychic <laughs> looking over the stuff. This, this, when he fainted. When he fainted. You know how hard it yeah. was? Like, no, I'm sitting, yeah. I'm yeah. What are the tricks, faint? like for aspiring actors out there, what are things you can do to work on that? Because it's important because it can ruin a death. moment. Think about death. <laughs> think about somebody putting your penis in a vice and squeezing it. Like, think about painful things and then it'll help you to just barely keep it together. She was the most Spider-Man. I'm Father Doug. I'm here to unpossess you. Do you know how to connect the cuts? Uh, uh, uh. Tic-tac-toe in your face! Something else that young actors or young writers can take from you, and you look at your career, you mentioned you have a writing partner and producing partner. Yeah. It's like, you generate a lot of your own stuff. Yeah. And you guys have worked together before, so you have people you're comfortable with. How important is that for somebody looking to start their career? Well, I think you, for it, as an artist, you want to help um, identify your point of view constantly. What's fun, because to be an actor is one thing, but even when you're you're acting, okay, you're, you're doing an interpretation of somebody else's material. You're like a, a jazz musician when you're doing this. And so it's better to play your song, your original songs and learn that and learn that kind of music. And then when you interpret somebody else's, you're bringing your flavor to their music. So as an artist, describe to me the scene in the living room when you have an encounter with her father's ashes. Like as an artist, <laughs> where's well, your artist, head at in that what was, moment? Because the thing was, I was trying to connect, man, with the material. <laughs> <laughs> you just take a shit on the floor. That's really what happens. Um, but but here's it, the thing. You know how hard it is to tell a really good shit joke? The one, one of the hardest things, that's what, like, when it's done right, like, Mike Myers uh, in, 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 what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it? Austin uh, Powers. Austin Powers. When you can do, make a shit joke, scatological humor, that's what they pay you the big bucks for, and that's when the good comedians do it right. Lastly, I'm getting the wrap-up sign. I have to ask you this, because I'm a fan of your career. Above the Rim is one of my favorite basketball movies, and just <laughs> one of my favorite movies from your career. What do you remember about working with Pac, and where do you think he would be today as an actor? I think either way it goes, he was gonna be dead. Because um, he, <laughs> he was crazy. Pac was always, he's hung around some of the craziest people. It's just like, why, are, like he got shot. I think while he was doing Above the Rim, he had a rape charge while he was doing Above the Rim. Pac always found himself in trouble because the reality of Pac was Pac wasn't a gangster. Pac was like one of the most smartest dudes you ever wanted to meet. I used to call him the Palmolive thug 
because his hands was so soft. I was like, what do you do, soak your hands in palm olive before you, before you go shoot somebody? You're palm olive thug. And he had these long eyelashes, like snuffleupagus. And I'm just like, come on, you're not a thug. You're a performing arts high school kid like me and Omar Epps. And I think we, the three of us used to hang, uh, us used to hang out and we all, it kind of, that's, that's the time he could just be pop and not be like, yo, you know, he's, he wasn't rah-rah, man. He was a really fun dude.